thank you very much for uh, for all coming down and uh, for the rest of your weekend. Um, presentation about uh, 50, 55 minutes or so, and really it's about how to try and improve diving safety by changing the culture and attitudes that we have towards uh, incident reporting and a just culture. And I'll go through in the presentation what uh, what I mean by just culture. Um, that's the scope. What's risk? Because that drives a lot of what we're looking at. Um, the cultures and, and what they are, what do they mean? What is an incident? And I get asked that quite a bit at uh, presentations. What's an incident? What should I report? And I'll go through, uh, and there'll be a bit of sort of interaction as well. Um, why should I report? Um, some case studies showing the value of reporting and the value of actually showing a complete story rather than the, 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 the end piece of what happened. Some opportunities in the UK, um, DISMs, the, the work that I've been looking at, and some conclusions. So my background, uh, for those who don't know, full-time, I'm in the RAF, uh, ex Herc air crew, now work as a, a requirements manager at Abbey Wood. Uh, Tech 2, advanced trimix, qualified. And January last year, um, I started a PhD at Cranfield looking at human, dive, uh, human factors in diving incidents and how to model the why behind what happens in a diving incident. Uh, 2010, I formed a company called Cognitas, uh, looking at trying to challenge how diving industry and divers go about their business using lessons learned from aviation, medicine, construction, such like. And then last April at Lids, I, uh, I launched uh, Disney's. So start off with risk. What is it? Um, at, at its basis level, it's probability times impact. How severe is what's going to happen and how likely is it? The problem is, we don't have a good idea of what the probability is within diving. Fortunately, incidents are quite rare, um, and so the numbers, it's quite easy to skew them. Impact can be minor injury to death. Uh, so there is a big scale of what the risk is. But as you move through your own training and your experience, your acceptable level of risk changes. So if you get an open water diver, jumps in, might be a bit circumspect doing a sort of 10 metre dive versus a advanced trimix diver, closed circuit rebreather diver doing a 70, 80 metre dive. Because of their training and their attitudes and their experiences, they have a different view of what that risk is. And as I say, it's all relative. So there's, there's some video shots here. First one, this is um, it's about 70 metres off uh, Malin Head. This is uh, Rich Stevenson's uh, expert off uh, with the subs up, up there. And as I say, this is 65, 70 metre diving. It's a long way down. This is pretty good. Um, but you'd look at that and think, okay, it's not too bad. But then when we move to the next scene, which is in a shallower depth, this is about 40 metres. Um, not particularly great place. You can lose your buddy quite easily. Um, as you can see, you know, the, the guy's just coming around there. So, but that's in the sort of the air diving depth. But then you get to this level and you think, oh, the risks, really massive. Yeah, they are. The, the, there are probably quite high probabilities of hitting the ground. And the impact is he's dead. But I would argue that the guys who are doing this have got a better appreciation of the risks they're taking than somebody who's just finished something like an advanced nitrox and deco. And then you get to um, the guys in the CDG, cave diving. Um, and that ranges from really nice water, clear, you know, glass-like to sump diving, solo diving. But again, these guys here have got a much better appreciation of what's involved in the cave diving they do. So it's all about what your personal attitudes to the risk are, but you need to be informed and make to be able to make that informed decision as to what the risk is. Yeah, diving is risky. It's not a safe sport because there is a chance of dying, of being seriously injured. But the challenge is understanding what those baselines are to make your own assessment of how risky something is. And I don't think that the, the advertising material that goes into the, the general recreational scuba diving makes that particularly clear. And, and this is the, the problem for the agencies. How do you educate your clients, the divers, the students, but don't scare them in the process? Because we want to open up diving to everybody but it's not for everybody. 
And we need to be able to mitigate and reduce those risks by informing uh, the client base. But it should be there to improve safety, not about reducing litigation. You see a lot of this stuff about, right, we're going to put processes in place to stop people being stupid. Well, actually, everybody will be stupid, no matter what processes you put in place. And what you're doing is reducing the comeback on the organisation, rather than encouraging personal responsibility. Here's a model I put together um, showing sort of an incident and, and the safety margins that are there. Now, they're, they're reduced for, uh, for technical diving, and when I gave this presentation to the cave diving group, um, there was a dotted line a bit further in uh, towards the incident. <laughs> because again, the risks, the, the margins that are involved uh, are much smaller um, for making a mistake. Uh, you yeah. check the question. Do you really believe that from a technical perspective, we genuinely have a reduced safety margin rather than an increased safety margin through recursive measures? That depends. Well, the risks are there. The probability, we don't know, but the impacts and, and the stuff that can work towards or um, increase the risks, you've got high PPO2s, you've got depth, exposure, gases, which don't exist in a recreational environment. And a lot of the technical bit where you could say is an overhead environment, be that deco or solid, you can't go straight to the surface. And, and there is this blurring between recreational and technical diving. What is technical diving? There is no sort of definition, but I think that the, um, I suppose the impacts are much greater at a recreational but level. The appreciation of the risk is proportionally so increased. Only if you get good training. Okay. Um, because if you're not taught what those risks are and how to mitigate them, you could end up jumping in and doing. An example of divers out in truck doing 50 metre air diving on a single alley AT. 53 metre dive, 15 minute bottom time. That is a technical dive, but people are not recognising that that is a problem doing that because lots of people do it. The, the margin for error is much smaller, especially if you don't mitigate that with twin sets, redundancy, training and things like that. But there's bits that reduce those safety margins, and I'll cover those uh, during the presentation, the, the human error bit, and there's active and latent failures within there. Resources in a commercial organisation, time and money is, is, is prime. And, and in the UK, we're pretty good because we have the HSE looking after the organisations or places like dive centres, making sure they uh, adhere to HSE standards. But you go to, say, the Far East or the Middle East, um, they may not be the same, um, where you are a sausage machine getting people through the door as quickly as possible, giving them a ticket because they pay for it. Those reduction, or that reduction in resources will have an impact on safety. Bad luck. Um, that gets cited quite a lot, but actually if you look at a lot of incidents, they are down to a problem that somebody has caused, set up the fall, and I'll go through those. And, you know, there are bits where a cave collapses while you're diving. All right, fine, well you can't guess that that's going to happen. If a wreck collapses, well, you've got a better idea because it's an unstable environment anyway. Um, DCS people go, oh, it's a bad luck hit. Well, again, it's a bit of a probabilistic um, risk, but there are things that you can do to make things safer. But actually, you can increase those safety margins by training. And in effect, that's what the training organizations do. Give you the skills, or should give you the skills and the mindset and the attitude to undertake an activity that is risky. They can't teach you everything but they can try and teach you to problem solve. Feedback, now that's in a, a local environment, say a club, um, or a, um, some, some feedback to a, a, an agency on how the course went. Something didn't go well, what can we do to make it better? And then where this uh, presentation will focus on really is reporting. Getting stuff from a local environment out to a much wider environment. Stuff that happens in a club here, will no doubt happen in a club 100 miles along the coast and further along. But people don't want to talk about it because they're ashamed or they've made a mistake or they're afraid that they will get harangued for the mistakes they've made. But they are repeated errors. And if you look at all of the accident stuff, it is commonality within, you know, there's a lot of commonality in these things. So the cultures themselves, what are they? Um, shared values and beliefs. What do people aspire to what their goals are, what do they want to achieve. These are 
three photos of cultures that are out there. Um, and I put the uh, scooter one up there because that is a stereotypical image of a GUE type DIR diving, which is considered a cult uh, organization. But they all have common beliefs, goals, and behaviors. What you try to aspire towards. Now, within diving, you've got a whole spectrum of cultures from a very commercially orientated to a club environment to very rigid ways. But what I'm trying to get with is, is a safety culture, but that's broken down into these five subsets. And then this slide explains those in a bit more detail. And I questioned um, a little while ago talking about whether or not diving had a safety culture or not, and I don't think it does. It's not, it has a little bit, but it's not a positive culture across the whole community. We don't have very good reporting. Um, the just culture, invariably when somebody posts something, a mistake they've made, it's a case of, ah, well you were trained by such and such agency, and they start going down that, rather than trying to say, what was the mistake you made, how can we learn and feed that back in? But we need to have all of those um, to, to make it work. And with, within my PhD in studies, I'm looking at reporting culture and just culture, trying to improve those. The reporting culture is li linked to that just culture. People won't report if they don't think they're going to get something back. And if they're going to report and somebody gives them grief for that mistake they made, they're not going to do it. And that was part of the, the survey that I ran last summer. Uh, it was part of the PhD. Looking at percentage divers who'd had incidents, the types of incidents that people had had, and I, I classified um, that, that top statement, I classified and gave some specific examples, which I'll cover in this slide. What the knowledge of the, uh, the BSAC system is, um, that is the main reporting system in the UK. Um, reasons for not reporting, because if can identify that, potentially try and change that to get more reports done in. And using the example of how many, how many occasions DCI occurs, versus reported. So the diving type of diving that took place uh, was split this broadly. Uh, you know, there's a lot of open circuit uh, recreational and an equivalent amount of open circuit and technical. CCR uh, was um, about four and a half percent. This was 725 people uh, responded. So this is of the, the respondents themselves. And it was quite a broad spectrum of experience and um, and an age. If this was the uh, the age group, um, and if you look at the uh, this is the technical and closed circuit rebreather age groups, they're all in. Well, all there's a large percentage in the right hand side of that graph, and you've got a lot of medical issues that start coming in above 40. So there are things that we could do to help ourselves medically before getting into a harsh physiological environment such as diving. 80% of the respondents said they'd had a, an incident, and that was out of air, unplanned separation followed by an unplanned solo ascent, an uncontrolled buoyant ascent, or DCI. Um, the, the separation and solo ascent bit was interesting because people went, well, that's not an incident as far as I'm concerned. But it goes against all of the stuff that the agencies teach. Unplanned is what I was talking about rather than planned. A, a lot of solo guys, you know, they go off and do solo diving. And whilst in itself isn't an incident, um, it does contribute to the mitigations you may have to stop the incident developing in the future. This was uh, understanding the reporting that took place. Um, what did people know about the, the British Tobacco Club incident reporting system? There's a lot of people don't know anything about it. And this was the recreational level. Now the reason I, I put this down to is a lot of the recreational divers out there are taught by non-British Tobacco Club clubs. And it's not in any of the syllabus or the, um, the training materials of those, even though all of the agencies are members of the British Diving Safety Group, which promotes this as well. So it's like, okay, so how do we get more reporting into the training materials? And these are the reasons for not reporting. And what I was quite surprised at is the, the low number of embarrassment personal feelings. A lot of people said, well, I'm not a BSEC member, I don't know about it. Um, so, okay, how do we get that out to the non-BSAC club guys? Unlikely to contribute to learning or it's trivial and not serious. Again, what is 
a um, an incident, and, and again, that sort of links to lack of clarity of incident. And I went through this, categorized it, and went to another couple of pretty experienced divers and said, given these statements, where do you think they fit within these blocks? So saying, you know, understanding the under-reporting that goes on, I looked at the 2010 Sub British Tobacco Club figures for DCI reporting. That's two, there was 105 incidents. Within um, the British Hyperbaric Association chambers, they recompressed about 350 divers. Um, so there's a, a three and a half fold issue there. DDRC study that um, was done in 2002, 45% of divers self-diagnosed that they had DCI, but they didn't report to a chamber. Okay. Uh, and then a survey that I did last year, as I say, this, this reporting survey, yeah, 25% of tech divers had had a DCI. Number of instructors that didn't report to a chamber was 10%. Now my own opinion on this is, most instructors uh, are sort of freelance or they work for a dive center and they need to earn that money. Now they can potentially assess the severity of their own DCI, but if they declare it, that's them off work because they need to get chambered or have a, another medical afterwards, which is lost income. You know, improvements are needed in the reporting culture we have. So, what, you know, what can we do? Guidelines on what is an incident. Um, independence may improve the uptake, in that if people are not a BSAC member, or they don't believe in the BSAC system, uh, or they don't know about it, there might be more reports go through this way. Make it easy to submit a report, um, which is a balance, trying to get a, a useful narrative that you can say, how did the incident develop? And what can you learn from it, um, which people don't want to spend the time to, other than, I had a DCI incident, great, thanks, <laughs> off you go. Um, it, it's getting that balance. Having something useful as an output, get that feedback back into the system so that people understand, these are the mistakes people make, how do I learn from them, I'll now apply those to myself. There's a lot of journal articles out there, but journals are closed, you know, research journals are, are closed, or you've got to be a member of an organization to get access to them uh, and people won't pay for that and then promotion of reporting within the diving organizations themselves and doing talks like this going to LIDS, Eurotech and, and making the reporting systems more aware or be more aware of. This is a, uh, a jigsaw or a, a clip from a um, <coughs> an article that was look at principles in air traffic management safety and it said this was essential if you were going to develop a just culture you needed to have these things in place, which is pretty much what I'd uh, you know found from the results that I've had here. It's not new um, material that I'm putting together. Um, it's just applying it from aviation, medicine, and such like into a recreational activity. So, just culture isn't no. It's not no blame. If people are negligent, yes, bring them up. You know, they need to have something, some feedback, and say, stop what you're doing, it's unacceptable. And, you know, you bring disciplinary or whatever activities to you. But most people make mistakes without realizing, without planning it. You don't go diving in, in the morning and go, right, I'm not, you know, I'm going to make a mistake that may kill somebody. Things happen, and you need to control those. But we need to create that culture where people can talk about the mistakes they make. So, you know, we need to create that environment to talk about or report an incident. Talk about the mistakes, console the errors that people have made. They will make mistakes. How do you talk to them about how you would correct what they did? And that's the coaching at risk behavior. Also recognizing that people will do stuff that is um, below what is expected standards as a, as a, a sort of culture and then punishing the reckless behavior. And that's the, the hard bit, is putting something in place that really does challenge that in a, in a recreational and voluntary activity. Because there is no, there's nothing in the UK that stops you from going diving without any certification. You don't need any qualification to go diving. Same as you don't need to go hill walking or mountaineering. But people who are put in a position of trust or um, supervision need to recognize they have a duty of care. But who draws the line? Unfortunately that last bit 
is normally the lawyers who decides what is reckless behaviour. Um, and it's a lot of it is about process, not about what happened on the day at the time, given the circumstances and the environment they were at. And that's that's a hard bit. So what's an incident? Um, National Research Council, um, you know, it's it's something that under slightly different circumstances could, be, could have been an accident. It's really a something stopped uh, or didn't complete the chain and therefore it uh, was just an incident, not an accident. And this is so broad. Any event that could have had adverse consequences but did not and was indistinguishable until the outcome. There's lots of stuff that goes on in diving that, oh, that was lucky, got away with that, and it didn't cascade through to an end game. So that's a near miss. But do you focus on everything that's there? Okay, these are some examples that I've put up. So an unplanned separation at depth, solo ascent. Okay, is that an incident? A lot of incidents could be prevented if you had much buddy, better buddy awareness and you stayed together because you might not necessarily, or you'd be able to stop the incident from propagating. Out of gas, just before the end of a bottom time. So you do an air share, do you deco, and then you ascend. Is that an incident? This one came up at a, uh, from some feedback I had from a, a liverboard. Twin independence, um, one cylinder had 20 bar, and the other cylinder had 210 bar. And they would go, great, well done, you didn't run out of gas. Yeah, but you weren't following what the protocols were for diving independence of swip, swapping cylinders uh, to make sure that you've got a balanced set. You know, there's something to be learned from that. Major narcosis event. That's not a problem. Nothing happened. No harm. But I've got video of, of a guy who was either CO2, probably, uh, narcosis, where he nearly, well, in fact, the only reason he didn't switch to a hyperoxic gas mix it's because the cylinder was turned off. He had no idea what he was doing at the time. Um, and it was all caught on video camera. But people should be aware of this sort of thing. If they don't know the scale of nitrogen or CO2 narcosis, they can't say that it's a valid risk, which they're, they're doing. DCI, no lasting effects once you're on a boat. Um, CCR failure at the end of the bottom time, bailout ascent, sort of a bit like out of gas. Is it considered an ascent? Well, people, if you don't capture this sort of stuff, you don't know how prevalent it is, and therefore the importance of, uh, of mitigating oxygen toxicity or a CO2 hit. Again, if they don't propagate through to a fatality, a lot of people don't consider it. DCI ending in paralysis or fatality. When I did a survey about three years ago, I said, anybody had any, you know, I asked for people who'd had incidents, and a lot of people went, no, nope, I haven't had anything. And they class sort of, Oxtox, serious DCI or fatality is an incident. But I would say all of those are because they are something that um, has happened that, uh, that sort of reduces the safety margins that you've put in place. Whether or not you capture them all is a, you know, a different thing because it's very difficult to capture all of that and resource to process it. Now, 9% of the survey, lack of clarity, more guidance required. And it's one of the things that I hope to try and do during the studies is try and define incident a bit better, maybe using a triage type system. Um, and then you say, well, actually, yes, these are all incidents. But when you get to the higher levels, these are the sort of things that should be reported. Why do we still make mistakes if we don't, con you know, if, 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 the, if the things, the incidents aren't going to contribute to learning, why do we still make the same basic mistakes? One of the feedbacks in the form was um, it wasn't, perceived relevant with referring to the annual report to my deep gas diving. But there are other deep gas divers out there. This is the guy who had the, uh, the potential CO2 narcosis on, uh, on his rebreather. I'm not going to report it because I don't consider uh, the annual report valid uh, for that. But people need to know these things happen. So, you know, what is the risk? How big is the problem? If it's a big problem, mitigate. If it's not a big problem, just carry on as you're doing. Where does the problem lie? Is it at the individuals themselves? Is it how they're trained? Is it how they're supervised as such, buddies or the organisations they sit? Or is it back up at the organisation level with the training that's provided? And there's a uh, Swiss cheese model which is quite popular, um, which looks at these different layers, the organisational influence, the unsafe supervision, 
um, precondition for unsafe acts, what you do as a person to set yourself up for the fall. And the unsafe act is the final sort of uh, straw that breaks the camel's back. And this video clip, um, actually it's you know, reporting how to stop it happening again. There's lots of stuff that happens, how can we prevent it from happening again? This clip here shows that it's not simple um, in the way that uh, an incident propagates because what it is, all of those layers are there. But until something propagates all the way through all of the holes, right to the far right hand side of the screen, it's not really an accident or an incident. But there's lots of ways of stopping this incident from occurring. And that's, you know, our training, our attitude, our skills, mindset. Those are the bits that stop it potentially from hitting the far right hand side. But there are lots of ways that we could detect what those problems are and try and learn from them. So the active failures, this is really where you know the accident analysis tends to look at what happened right at the end, the active failure. What did they do wrong? They drowned because they didn't ditch their weight belt. Okay, why didn't they ditch their weight belt? What was stopping them? Errors, these are things that you um, make mistake. You, you, um, you've not learned such so, or you've forgotten. Skill-based errors, how to do a DSMB launch, how to shut down properly, how to monitor your gas, how to clear your, uh, your mask, how to do buoyancy. Decision errors. We all make decisions based on our experience and our learning. And this, to me, was a very poor decision. Uh, you've got Trimix in one side, you've got 50% in the other. <laughs> awesome. uh, on a, a manifolded twin set. Um, and I can't see why... It, well, actually, in fairness, they did analyse the gas, which is a good start. But I cannot see a situation where you would need to dive Trimix one side, 50% on the other. You're never going to get the exposures that you need 50% uh, there. So, and notwithstanding the fact that, you know, you could just self-mix by opening that uh, the manifold. Um, but your decisions are based on what somebody's told you, what you've done, what you've learned, what you've read. Um, but if your instructor hasn't had a lot of real-world experience, he's only going to teach you what he knows, which may be a fairly limited skill set. So, you know, the advocate of choose your instructor because he does the diving that you want to dive, that you want to do not just somebody who holds a ticket. Perceptual errors. Um, there's a couple of bits here with, with the environment we're in. You can have very poor vis, bright torch, raging current, and it's like a snowstorm. Vertigo, uh, and I've had some feedback of somebody having vertigo off here, in, off Plymouth. Um, just because the current was so strong, and just not being aware of which way it was up or down. And you go to the other end of the scale, where you go out to, say, the Middle East, Egypt, or where you've got 60, 70, 80 meters of visibility, and it's really difficult to judge where you are in the water column, uh, and you can end up much deeper than you expected. And as you go deeper, that delta pressure changes uh, are less, so you can drop down much bigger depth, much bigger delta, without realizing where you are. Violations, these are motivational. What you do is a choice to do that. And violation is quite a strong word, but it is people breaking rules. Although we don't have rules in diving, we have best practice, but things like analysing gas, you know, that should be something that you do all the time. But people go, oh, I'll get away with it, didn't happen, didn't happen, and then you start setting a new baseline, and then you start getting further and further away from safe diving practice or best practice as to what's good or not, because you've made that judgement, you say, ah, it didn't happen the last time, I can move on. Running out of gas, that to me is... You know, that should never happen in diving with the training we have. Entrapment, okay, depends, but that, a lot of that could be entanglement or getting stuck somewhere. Don't go somewhere you know you can't get out of, and if it's a penetration of a wreck or something like that, make sure you've got adequate lights and line, the same as they do with cave diving. Don't go somewhere you, as I say, you can't get out of. So. And equipment problems. These are not problems with equipment itself, it's about using equipment. So messing up an SMB launch or not being able to use your equipment properly, not the equipment failing. The equipment itself is normally pretty reliable as long as people maintain it. But this is what you do to set yourself up for the fall. Mental fatigue. You know, does, does that look familiar on dive boats? People either staying out late 
um, or just having long journeys. You know, it is a harsh environment. Getting everything stacked in your favour has got to be a good thing. Poor communication and coordination. Get things sorted out on the surface. It's much easier to talk through what the dive plan is, what the mitigations are going to be, um, rather than sit there at the bottom of the dive and go, I don't know, or the end of the dive, who's going to send the SMB up? Who's going to line off? Do something on the surface, talk it through. It doesn't have to be really in-depth, but having a good idea of what you're going to do does save some confusion when you get to the bottom. Being task fixated or saturated, it's really easy to focus in on something um, and not be aware of what else is going on around you. Today, doing the rescue stuff, trying to set up my buddy to, to rescue, I was having a real problem being aware of where the third person was because I was focusing so much on getting my, my casualty sorted. But that's, you know, that's just having to stop, think, where is he? Right, carry on walking, what are you doing? Don't let your buddy swim off, and alternatively, don't swim off from your buddy. You know, be aware of where they are all the time. Complacency. This is cited quite a lot, but actually, it's, it's something you can't really nail down. It's just getting relaxed in your attitude to what the risk is. And the reason why the, the arrow is showing there, and it might not show up quite so well, but there's a nice stream of bubbles hanging from the, uh, or coming out of the top of the regulator, which is the safety bottle. Now, somebody said previously, oh, this was probably a Sherwood regulator that's bubbling away anyway. Well, I, so what? If it's a safety bottle, do you particularly want it to be leaking gas? Um, and then the bottom one really is, what's in the bottle? Um, you marked up for 100% or potentially 50%. Right, that's not a good thing to be. Loss of situational awareness. Be aware of where you are, where your buddies are, what you're doing. This is a shot for inside one of the LSTs off uh, Portland. Uh, inside the engine room um, with a percolation coming down but I knew that on the right hand side of the screen you can see the cave line is going back out now I was concentrating on Alex my buddy there trying to identify what the engine was on this but I knew that that's where the line was and I knew that we had come through several passageways through doorways to where we were so even if it was really bad as it was on the way out I knew how many passageways to go through to get there that's quite a complex environment there, but you could be simply, as I've seen an example, watching people swim through a silt cloud at somewhere like Stony, because they waited for a group of divers to come past in sort of seahorse fashion, big cloud, and then they swam through the cloud and then lost their buddy. Well, you know, shock horror. Is that, was that a surprise? Why not go over the top of the silt cloud? But don't put yourself in a situation that you, you know, be aware of what's going to happen. Medical issues. This was a survey, 33% of um, divers known medical problem uh, before they went diving. And a third of that lot um, went to a doctor and said there was a problem uh, and you shouldn't go diving, but they still went diving. Alcohol less than 24 hours, or less than 12 hours, yeah, 45 and 57% in one survey, or two surveys there. And then this one was published, uh, the last one, uh, drinking and diving. 18% of respondents said that um, they weren't fit to drive, uh, but they were fit to go diving. Um, it's an attitudinal thing. It's a culture that fortunately is getting better, but the club environment of going, getting drunk, then going diving the following morning. Um, in the technical world, that's getting better, but in the recreational, it's still part of that culture. And again, because incidents are quite rare, you can't see that things happen, although there was something like 40 odd percent of respondents have said that they'd seen an incident which um, they could attribute to alcohol from the previous day. Unsafe supervision. Um, it's not necessarily about supervision. We, we you know, direct instructor type uh, supervision. We do buddy diving, all the agencies teach it. So you, you are there to look out for each other. So don't just sit there and not say anything when they do something wrong, rather than waiting for them to set themselves up for a fall uh, later on in the dive. Uh, when you go, ha ha, this is going to be a laugh. You know, be aware of what's going on around you with uh, with the dives, with other divers, and um, they can then um, spot things before they get in the water. The challenge then is, 
how do you say something to a complete stranger on a dive boat that they may have got their kit configured incorrectly or unsafely in a positive manner rather than being in a negative manner. Cross cockpit authority or cross cockpit or authority gradient. Um, the assumption that the more experienced or senior should be correct. There's lots of examples of this in aviation um, where the senior captain in the aircraft is right and they crash and the junior pilot has been proved to be correct but just didn't have either the authority or was scared to say something to him and say, no, you can't do that. We are not going to carry on. And I'm sure the same thing happens in diving where you've got a very senior instructor there who's making a mess of it, but you're saying, I don't want to say something because A, I'm not sure, or B, I know he's going to bite my head off when I make that comment. So create that environment where you can talk about it. And especially in, in club environments where um, you have potential autocrats at the top of the, uh, the, the diving club. Instructors not teaching to standards or going beyond to prove a point. Really, is all the agencies have standards which in the main are safe. They wouldn't get past the HSE if they weren't safe. They may not be best practice depending on your view of, of safety. Um, but some people don't teach those, they cut the corners, or you end up with the, um, the sadistic instructor who's teaching something just to prove a point. I know more than you do and I'm going to beast you on this. Well, that doesn't help learning. Uh, and we have quite a big dropout rate uh, in diving at the recreational level. People don't continue. Constructed debris. Every dive is a learning dive, irrespective of what happened. If it all went well and nothing bad happened, great. Let's do that again next time. That worked. Or we have, as we did today, things that didn't go to plan. Talk about it. How would we improve it for the next time? Bear that in mind. And it goes back to earlier with the decision making decision making process. You make decisions based on feedback and experience you've had. If you haven't had that feedback loop, it's hard to improve. The organisational influence. This is the bit that I get into uh, um, hot water with the agencies. Is diving is promoted as safe. And in the main, it is. It's a relatively safe activity. But these aren't the pictures that appear on the brochures um, when it comes to advertising diving. You know, a client walks into a dive shop and says, oh, I would like to go diving. Uh, I'd like to learn. I'm going on holiday in two weeks. Can I go? And the guy behind the desk goes, well, you do realise you might die taking part in this activity. All right, then, fine, thanks. I'll go and do something else. You know, it's a prof these are profit-making organisations and have to promote it in a certain way. But I'm not convinced that all of the risks are shown, especially at the, um, the entry level, the risks are involved. As you move up through technical... Uh, and rebreather diving, they become more apparent. But only if your instructor has had that experience or skill set, the mindset to pass that on to you. Annual fatality rates, we're looking at between one in 30,000 to 100,000 Paddy Pro divers, one in sort of 16 to 33,000 divers. UK stats are half to one per hundred thousand dives and that was an assumption based on a survey that uh, the British Tobacco Club did in 2007 uh, looking at things about 35 dives a person uh, per year. Uh, as a comparison within the construction industry you're looking at one in 17,000 murder rate in London 1.2 per hundred thousand population okay that's not so good so you've got about this you know the, the, the periodicity is the problem in, in trying to compare those things. And actually we don't have a like-for-like -like comparison across divers, dives and exposure. Rebreather diver may do a four or five hour dive but he only does ten of those in a year. Call it. Um, his experience levels are probably quite low but his duration in the water is quite you know, is comparable to somebody who's doing 31 hour dive sort of thing. You know, it's, but these were the figures of the depths that I could get out of the annual report between uh, 2009 and 1998, and a large percentage of them in shallow depths. Right? We don't know how many dives take place in the shallows because we don't have that data. But just because um, you've got a uh, the depth is the dangerous place, well, actually, it might not be the case. So, you know, agencies are primarily profit driven. They've got three different models, really. You've got a high throughput, low profit, but it's self-perpetuating. If you're getting people through 
the door as quickly as possible, they're not potentially getting the life experience to pass that on. But long courses, they cost more, but there's less throughput. So it's the same sort of profit model at the end, but you don't get the number of clients through because people want to do stuff now and they want it as cheap as possible. That is the, you know, the, the model of the modern population, now cheap, give it to me. You know. Then you go to the other end, voluntary and mentoring systems. It takes longer, but again, that's sort of nail culture. But the advantage of that mentoring system is you get that feedback loop from the guys, and they should have that experience. There's no time driven. There's no need to drive people through the door as you know, a sort of sausage machine. You've got the problem of um, organizations not developing with new techniques. Nitrox came in, a lot of for all, band can't have it. It's now being accepted. Trimix. Oh, I can't do that, real proper devil gas, everybody's going to die. Well, actually, recognition that below 40 metres, and in some cases below 30 metres, Trimix is, is a good thing to have, to have a clear head to mitigate some of the narcosis risks. Having an effective quality control or QA quality assurance system is required. There is no guarantee that once an instructor has finished an instructor training course, that he's teaching what's needed to be done in five, ten years' time, with the exception of a few agencies. Um, and as those agencies grow, their QC and QA system is it, it, going to be a challenge. Um, it's much easier when because they're smaller at the moment. <clears throat> and equipment design. Um, this, I think, sits in the organizational area because there are things that organizations or equipment manufacturers have to do. And I think these, yeah, the next slide shows some of these. Um, top left is... A, an auto BCD inflation device when you stop <laughs> flow, you know, when air flows. Well, air flows because you, you know, potentially stops because you've run out of gas. Well, actually, it isn't going to be able to auto inflate your BCD because there's no gas there. Um, again, it's, it's mitigating a problem that doesn't exist um, or shouldn't exist if you have proper buddy control. And actually, it's linked on the bottom one, which is a light, which is a light that comes on at a preset. Uh, uh, pressure it, it port, plugs into the high pressure port and so a dive master can see having a quick look round who's in or out of in or has enough gas well the, the litigation uh, is going to be challenging there because you sit there and go if that doesn't work and somebody drowns are the family going to say well actually the dive guard should have been monitoring the, the, the guy on top and if they or the, the light on top and if they say, well, no, it's only there as advisory, why bother having it fitted? You can solve this problem by training people to look at their gas and monitoring it much better. Top uh, right is the foldy up fins. Um, you know, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Being able to walk to the edge and then clip the fins down? Well, put the fins on in the water. Or put them on just before you get in. You know, having a fin break one of those catches um, while you're out somewhere, it's not a good place to be. And, you know, the middle is um, a single boot with a set of wheels on the bottom of it so you can take it across a car park. <laughs> Carry it. You know, why bother having something there for the sake of it? And, and then you get to the good parts. At the bottom, OLED dis displays on dive computers now are fantastic. Being able to see in a cave or in a, a deep, dark environment or even just poor viz, look down, look at the gauge and see the numbers as opposed to the old liquid crystal displays. And, you know, there are now more prevalent OLED displays. Um, sorry, the, um, the last bit there was just culture. That's something that the organizations <coughs> need to um, develop in their training materials and recognize that everybody makes mistakes and get that message out there. And don't criticize somebody. And give them a hard time for making an honest mistake. Everybody makes mistakes, even the best in the, uh, in the industry. These are some case studies that, that show why or how an incident can develop and why you need to report the whole story and not just a snapshot of what happened. So this one's a uh, manual CCR shutdown in the water. It's an experienced Trimix instructor, but a relatively new uh, rebreather diver. A um, couple of times he'd forgotten to shut down the O2 post dive and the KISS is a uh, constant mass flow device. So if you don't shut the O2 off, it just continues to pump O2 into the, into the system. So he'd get the, uh, the rebreather and uh, the following day it would be empty. It's like, oh, right, I've got to do this. So he then started getting into the good habit. 
uh, of shutting it down as soon as you de-kit it. But this shutting down progressed from sitting on the bench, shutting it down, to walking from the lift, to sitting down, shutting it down, to shutting it down on the lift. And then on this uh, dive in question, um, he was waiting for the dive in front of him to be picked up, he was about to be picked up, he thought, great, I shut my O2 down uh, on the surface, um, boat had to go around, couldn't pick the guy up. So he was in the water with the O2 shut down, breathing the loop, breathing it down. Um, he eventually got picked up and felt really light-headed and not very good while standing on the lift. So he'd just been picked up and he spat the loop out and it had a PPO2 of 0.07. Um, maybe 30 seconds beforehand, he would have passed out in the water. Um, but this would have probably been reported generally as Diver shut down O2, you know, if a fatality had occurred, he shut his O2 down in the water, he broke the rules, he shouldn't have done it. But there wasn't one, you know, one reason for that incident, and you need to understand the backstory as to why that happened, but that's not the sort of thing that gets collected or um, the, the reported on. Next one uh, is the rebreather incident talking about it's an experienced mod 3 level diver, um, stressful previous few days, um, recovering a body, and... Um, had driven some distance as well with his kit. So he was tired, had a few issues on descent, um, carried on, um, well he sort of had some issues on the first descent, came back up again, tried to clear them, saw another couple of divers go down and went, ah, I'll follow them, that'll be fine, uh, they're okay. So he carried on um, despite having these issues uh, tickling on, or trickling along. It was all caught on head mounted video, which is brilliant. So you could see the handsets, and you could hear his breathing uh, rate going uh, through the roof and, and just all of the stuff that was going on. Um, it was either CO2, it was narcosis of some sort. I don't think it was nitrogen because the gas mix is involved. Um, so I think it was CO2, which may have been using a partially used scrubber that had been vibrated whilst driving to the dive site. Once he bailed out, um, the problems really started. Um, he previously had had HP hoses fail on his bailout stages, so he replaced them with button gauges because he didn't want to have that failure. Um, he's now bailed onto one cylinder, um, his bottom stage, breathing really quickly, and he doesn't know how much gas he's using. Um, so he's at about 30-odd, mid-30s, um, not sure how much gas is left in the cylinder because he can't read the button gauge. I know, I'll go to my other stage, um, which was an O2 bottle. Um, fortunately, that bottle was switched off. So he didn't breathe the contents of the hyperoxic mix through luck, more, more luck than judgment. Um, but he then you know, got up to depth, uh, shallow depth, and bailed out or transferred over to the, the other bottle. But it was only because of something else that stopped him uh, being in a, uh, a situation. It again probably reported as potential narcosis leading to bailout, and again many reasons or many opportunities to stop the incident developing. When I reviewed the video with a the guy, they're going down the shot line to start with, and I saw his buddy disappear down. It's like, where's he going? Oh, we're, we're solo diving. All right, okay. That's just you know his choice how he dives. But there were so many things that could have been helped or stopped by a, another diver in the water going stop. Don't do anything else. I'll help you. Um, and that's the, the sort of the argument for me for team diving, even at the highest levels of technical diving. You may be competent, but you will make a mistake, and a buddy may be there to stop you, or a buddy will be there, but he may stop you carrying on propagating that incident. But we never see how many saves happen <coughs> because of a team or a buddy environment. Um, we only see the things that don't happen. So, you know, why should I really, is the, the summary here, data provision, comes out at all the conferences, lack of data, we don't know what the, the problems are and the scale of the problems. There's insurance and financial implications I think is one of the, the challenges of not collecting data. Um, Cave Diving Group reduced their insurance premiums when they showed that their fatality rate was less than their underwriters thought it was. But they collected this data, went through it and said right there you go, that's our fatality rate per dive. Ah, okay, we'll reduce your premiums accordingly. But a lot of people I've spoken to said, well, if we, if we find this information, 
that will show that diving is more risky than it actually is, uh, and the premiums will go up. Well, okay, but wouldn't it be better to have people making informed decisions as to what's going on? Lessons learned. This is where I'm trying to push a lot of my stuff uh, for, for reporting is we make lots of mistakes. We can learn from them, and others can learn from the mistakes we make. Um, but we need to have that feedback loop. Because if you don't report them, and then you get some analysis done, and put that out there to say, this is where the mistake was made, it's much harder to get that learning uh, completed. This came from the uh, train crash inquiry west of London. And really, a lot of these issues are not the person making the mistake at the end. They flow through from the organisation to the supervisory level to set themselves up and then they make the failure itself. And that's the same when you look through all of the safety analysis that goes on for lots of things, construction, medicine, aviation. These propagate through. And we need to be able to quantify this to say, look, the stuff that could be done further up the chain to prevent incidents from occurring. And as I said earlier, trying to effect a rescue is not a good place to be because it's going to be pretty much a luck call on whether or not it works well. Um, if we can stop the incidents from occurring in the first place, it's got to be a good thing. But how do you get that information out there? I, I put this down as two groups. The type one, they're the professionals or the, the, the organisations who say, right, we need to do this to put something in place and we will control what people do. So we need to have that level of data. And then you've got the other end, the sort of type two group, the fun divers, who don't want to be told what to do. This is my activity, it's my voluntary activity. Why should you tell me what I can and can't do? And there was some work that was done um, by these guys looking at views on safety culture within a, um, an organisation and what was important. And what the executives thought was important was different to the management who were trying to balance off what the executives wanted oops, and what the, uh, the frontline workers were doing. And you get to the, the, the guys at the coalface who were doing stuff and went, we don't care about all the, the big figures. We want to sort out the little problems that are hurting us at our level. And it, I think the same thing exists within diving, that you have a, a recreational fun activity where people want to know how to do something safe, but they don't want to be told you are to do this or you are to do that. So it's a bit of an educational uh, concept that needs to be sorted there to deal with all of those levels. So in the UK, um, reporting opportunities are there. You've got online forums, um, training agencies reporting. So things like Paddy have got an instant reporting system, but that is biased towards litigation. In fact, at the top of the form it says this form has been prepared in the event of litigation. It's not there about a learning opportunity. It's about making sure that an agency can say they did what they did to the best of their ability to prevent the incident occurring. Manufacturers reporting, they probably have their own reporting systems, but with a level of litigation that's going on, I'm not convinced that uh, that level of detail or data would be made public because it would open those manufacturers up to uh, saying, well, you already knew about this problem, why didn't you solve it? This was uh, an example from, uh, from Canada. They got underwater councils for each um, state um, which collate incident data. DAM, uh, which isn't so prolific in the UK because we have a very good insurance and uh, medical cover system. DAN are an insurance company and so they collect data to try and uh, work out what their actuarial risk is to underwrite people. British Tobacco Club have got their annual reporting system and is, is the most comprehensive in the UK. Um, I believe it's got some limitations and could be improved um, primarily through the feedback loop that's there, but they collect a, a significant amount of incidents. And one that I put together as, uh, as DISMS, the Diving Incident Safety Management System. The presentation that I gave at uh, Eurotech went through this in more detail, uh, and I'll link um, from this presentation another video of how DISMS works, how you can enter data, how you can retrieve it, how you decide what level of disclosure of information is there. Uh, and you know the, the URLs there and there's some cards at the front uh, if you want to take those. But the idea behind uh, DISMS was really it's being open. Um, everybody has access to it. 
Um, it's not owned um, by anybody. Um, it's confidential. It's not. It can be anonymous, but the user defines the level of disclosure that's out there. You can make the whole report public, or you can just make little bits of it public, or none of it public, um, so that you get that level of disclosure, so people know what's there. It's a live database, and this is one of my sort of key areas, is the annual report that's produced by the British Tobacco Club. They produce a flat PDF at the end of the year. Their database may be updated, but what's out in the public domain is not. And so you don't get any additional information that's fed back. Um, DISMS is there all the time. So if stuff comes up in the future, you know, it comes up, for instance, in the past, that data can be updated and people can go and search. It's online, um, it's got um, secure certificates, uh, web-based, and it's got a, an optimized mobile browser. It works well in the mobile browsers. Um, it's independent, as I said. Um, I have a number of people who provide feedback and advice for incidents that are there from all of the agencies, uh, with the exception of the British Tobacco Club. Um, but they all provide information as to what an incident, how an incident developed, stuff that could be learned from there. And people can conduct searches or export from there. Um, so you can do keyword searches, you can look at depth searches, those sort of things, which is not possible in a flat PDF. And, and I've tried to see whether or not it's possible to uh, copy and paste the copyrighted annual report into a database make that public and I've been told I can't do that even though I think that it would be of great benefit um, to the diving community to be able to search across multiple years looking for certain things but you know I know that that DISMs can be improved there's more analysis needed in the reports but it's time consuming when the reports come in uh, and I believe that's one of the reasons that the British Tobacco Club report doesn't have a lot of analysis because they don't have the resource to do it um, I need to increase the number of filter options to make it more usable for people. Um, I've spoken to uh, guys in Denmark, sorry, in Holland, about improving the number of options within the closed circuit rebreather bits so that people can put more detail in quickly. People don't want to put type forever in there, and I don't want to have to try and pull specifics out. So if I can make as many options as drop down selectables, uh, that makes the entry quicker. I need greater uptake from the user community. And part of that is getting involved with the organizations and doing presentations like this. Um, but a reporting system is only as good as the reports that go into it and the analysis that goes back out. Uh, and those, those need to be improved. So in summary, really, is there are a lot more opportunities for, for lessons learned. People talking about incidents they've had in a club environment. Can we get that same pub culture of talking about something that went wrong out into the wider field. Because within your own peer group you can talk about a mistake you made and they're not going to harangue you for it. But if you go up to the next level of say a regional community or a, a sort of a national community and you talk about that in an online area, um, there is a lot of risk of people going, you did that wrong because you weren't doing it how we do it. Uh, and that's not necessarily the, the, uh, the best thing. It's easier, I think, to address the lessons learned bit and the total stats because the diving, trying to track how many dives are out there, what sort of diving they do is so variable uh, and I think it would probably have a much better or much greater impact on diving safety if people can learn from others mistakes. Now recognizing that somebody made a mistake and then applying it and changing your own behavior is the next step uh, and that's that's the next big one is how do you get people to, uh, to change their behavior um, I got told earlier, I was chatting with a guy about it, an experiment they did where there were 20 people in a room, one of which was a subject of the experiment, the other 19 people were um, actors. Fire alarm went off when they were filling in these job applications, smoke started coming out, and in some cases it took up to 20 minutes before they went, uh, we better leave, because the other 19 actors were sitting there filling out the forms and not reacting to what's going on. And the other person sitting there going, uh, what's going on? Well, it must be all right because the other 19 people around me aren't changing. And I think that sort of group behavior um, is probably in uh, evidence within diving. 
It needs a stronger reporting culture, but that needs to be driven top down. I can be involved in presentations like this and at conferences like this, giving talks, um, but I'm only sort of one person and then that cascades out. It needs to come top down. But if you don't have a just culture, you won't improve that reporting. And it's getting to be that, that sort of positive feedback. And the sort of final bit is, is DISMS, I think, provides part of that uh, jigsaw puzzle by providing that reporting system that's there. So, you know, the, the top bit, yeah, it's not criminal to make an error. But if you don't learn and change your behaviour, you're not going anywhere. You're just going to carry on there. So, any questions? <laughs>